Good day, grade 10s. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. Um, in today's lesson, we're going to carry on with states and matter and kinetic molecular theory, and then we're going to probably move on to the development of the atomic model and so on. We'll see how far we get. Um, before we do that, I'd just like to welcome you again and to remind you that this is brought to you by turnable.org. Please, grade 10s, I'd like to suggest that you join the grade 10 science um, class. The reason I would like you to do that is because in that way you could mess me, message me so that you could tell me if there's sections that you're worried about, if there's sections that you would like to go through specifically, and then I can do that. Um, if you've got exam paper questions, etc., we can all work through those. I'm sure we could work through a nice, very organized um, interactive lesson if we work together. Um, otherwise, the nice thing about the turnable.org platform is that there's hundreds of resources. There are videos, there are multiple choice questions, there are exam papers, and all of it is free to you to use as much as you want. Um, and it's all to try and help you understand the subject better and do well in your tests and exams. Right, so let's get started straight away with the states of matter. So if you remember, we were talking about the fact that there were three phases or states of matter, there was solid, liquid, and gas. And from where we left off, and if you guys are struggling with going through the fact that we do this every second day, feel free to go back and watch the previous video. You can actually just click on the link in exactly the same way as you got to this lesson on the previous day or sec two days ago or whatever, and you'll find that same video and then you can watch a recording of it, okay? So it doesn't, it doesn't ever get lost. And you can watch it as many times as you want. Right, so let's carry on. So we're talking about solid liquids and gases and we're talking about the fact that there's melting points and boiling points and they differ and melting point remember is the temperature at which something goes from a solid to a liquid whereas a boiling point is some the point at which it goes from a liquid to a gas and vice versa and vice versa okay so um there you go. So it got from solid to liquid or from a liquid to a gas. So if we look at this, you can see that you've got water, nitrogen, oxygen, diamond, all the different things, okay? But please note important, the interesting things. We've got diamond here, which is at 3,550 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature at which it goes from a solid to a liquid. And then from 4,830 degrees, it goes from a liquid to a gas. So do you see we need huge amounts of energy before you can actually get, sorry, before you can actually get it to change phase. Whereas over here, nitrogen is changing from a solid to liquid at minus 210 degrees Celsius, and then from a liquid to gas at minus 196 degrees Celsius. So do you see that it is gas at room temperature? This is a gas at room temperature. This is a gas at room temperature. Okay, now I'm not going to go through all of these. This is really just to give you a reference table to show you that the melting points and boiling points change quite vastly depending on what the substances are. I mean, diamond we know is made up of pure carbon, okay, pure carbon, but it's a non-metal, non-metal. Yeah, we've got copper, which is a metal, and it also has fairly high of boiling points and melting points. And then there's mercury, which is, I'm hoping you know, the only liquid metal that exists on our planet that we know of. So mercury, and you'll see that, yeah, it's boiling, I mean, it's melting point is from solid to liquid is minus 39 degrees. So it is liquid at room temperature. And it was one of the, this is one of the main reasons that they use this as um, a measure of, of temperature in your mercury thermometers. So if your mom and dad have got a thermometer at home that you use to measure your temperature when you are sick or something, the thermometer is either going to have a silver liquid in it, silver liquid, or it's going to have a red liquid. 
Now, the silver liquid is this mercury, which is a metal, and it's metal, it's liquid at room temperature. And the problem with mercury is that it's very poisonous, it's very dangerous. So you they're changing it now to an alcohol. They change it to alcohol because alcohol, if you look over here, it's got a kind of a similar range. It's going from minus 114 degrees to 78 degrees. Now you might think, well, if it can go from a solid to liquid at 78 degrees Celsius, then it's not as useful as mercury. But if your body temperature is 78 degrees Celsius, you're dead, okay? You're not supposed to have a body temperature that high. In fact, it's supposed to be about half that. So they can easily use alcohol and replacement of mercury, but then alcohol is see-through, it's colorless, most alcohols. So ethanol is definitely colorless. So what they do is they put a dye in it, and that's why you would see a little red line going up and down the thermometer. Okay, let's move on. So there's what is called a heating curve of water, and this curve is very, very important. They love to ask this curve in exams. They will either ask you to, sorry, I went past it. Oh, sorry, I got excited. They'll either ask you to draw it, or they'll ask you to label it, or they'll ask you about it. Okay, so let's discuss the heating curve of water. Now, water is very special because water changes from a solid to a liquid at 0 degrees Celsius, right? But do you see that it takes a bit of time to do it? It goes from here, okay, to here. And during that time, the temperature doesn't change, okay, but it is changing from a solid, which is in the form of ice, to water. And during that time, we are heating up our piece of ice. So at this point in time, from here to here, we've got our little block of ice, okay? And then it starts melting. And during this time, it melts. And at this point here, it is now water. It's now taking on the shape of the container. It is water. But the reason it's special and the reason it does this is because the particles are held in fairly strongly together in a crystalline lattice. They are held together in a crystal. Okay, we call it a crystalline lattice, okay? And the bonds between the crystalline lattice atoms are quite strong. So it takes quite a lot of energy to break these bonds. So what happens is there's a time when all the energy that you're adding by heating it up isn't changing it from a solid to a liquid. All it's doing is basically letting these molecules vibrate fast enough so that they can break the bonds so that it can change into liquid and then the temperature of the thing will start increasing again. And exactly the same thing happens when you get from, well, actually at boiling point, it just changes to steam and then you don't have to worry. So that is important and you need to know what is happening there because they like to ask it, okay? So this is the heating curve of water. People used to think that it looked like this, that it went and then this would suddenly go, at this point here, it would suddenly change from a solid to a liquid instantaneously. And then from here, it would be liquid to gas, okay? And it was only afterwards that they realized that actually there's a little period in time where it takes the molecules a little bit more energy to break those bonds. So there's no temperature change. If we have a thermometer there, there's no temperature change. It won't change the temperature of the water or the surrounds. It's going to stay at naught because all the energy we're adding in this flame, and I'm drawing a candle, okay, or whatever, this flame is going to just be making the particles move faster. Then suddenly we get to the point where all the particles are separated from each other and we now have water. When we get to water and steam, okay, a similar thing happens, but not for quite as long, and then you go up again. Okay, so please know this heating curve of water. Right, now we need to talk about the kinetic molecular theory. And the kinetic molecular theory is incredibly important. Guys, you need to know this theory because 
You need to know it because it's important all the way through to matric. They're going to ask you about this kinetic molecular theory in matric exam papers. And if you understand the kinetic molecular theory, then the whole of chemistry becomes a lot easier. So let's go through it nice and slowly. First of all, it helps us to explain why matter exists in different phases. And remember these phases are solid, goes to liquid, goes to gas, and I know I've heard you guys shout out to me already, there's plasma, but we're not worrying about plasma because plasma is strange, okay, it doesn't follow these three, and it's not strictly in the curriculum yet because they don't quite know how to fit it into this whole kinetic molecular theory of matter yet. The kinetic theory states, first of all, that all matter is composed of particles which have a certain amount of energy. Okay, this energy allows the particles to move at different speeds depending on the temperature. There are spaces between the particles and attractive forces between the particles when they come close together. Okay, so let's talk about this. Remember I said to you that if you think, I want to think of a solid particles. So solid particles can be found in a crystalline shape, okay, and I draw my little blocks like this, and then all these little circles are atoms, for example, and the lines aren't really there, okay, they are just helping me draw my thing, so effectively what you're looking at is that there, where there are imaginary lines between the particles. Do you see how horrible it looks when I put my lines in? So that's why I put the lines in, so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so what happens is there's like a crystalline structure in all solids, okay? And these lines here don't actually exist. They are imaginary. We're just drawing them to help us see how the atoms are structured around each other. Now, what happens in solids? They vibrate. So they've got energy, but they vibrate on the spot. They don't actually move, right? In liquids, these bonds between the solids break up and then they move a bit more. And then in gases, they fly freely all over the show, which we'll talk about a bit more in a bit more detail in the next few slides. But the point is that all matter, even if it's solid, has a certain amount of energy. And obviously, all matter is composed of particles. And this energy, like I've said, allows the particles to move at different speeds depending on the temperature. So the colder it is, the less energy the particles are going to have, and therefore the slower the particles are going to move. So like I said, a solid, which is usually the lowest energy form of any element, what is the lowest, lowest energy form of any element, is going to have particles that just vibrate on the spot because they've got so little energy. Okay, and then if they heat it up, they get more energy, so they move around, and gases they go zinging around. There are always spaces between the particles, and that is very important. And also, there are attractive forces between the particles when they come close together. And we will talk a bit more about that. Okay, so that is the kinetic theory, and you need to know what the kinetic theory states. It is a very nice question that they like to ask you in the exams. Now, also what's important, and this is very important, is that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. If they ask you for the definition of temperature, you are right. It is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. If you leave out the word average, you get it wrong because it's not the kinetic energy of the particles because first of all, the kinetic energy of the particles changes almost instantaneously all the time because every time a particle bumps into another particle, and here I am making little clapping sounds with my hands. Let me explain. So the particles are in this container, right? And as they zing around and bump into other particles, they lose energy, okay? And so what happens is that energy gets transmitted into the surrounds. So that is, for example, the reason why your coffee gets cold or tea gets cold if you leave it for long enough because the particles are bumping around each other and every time they bump around and they're bumping to each other and into the particles on the surface, they lose energy. So this is why it's the average kinetic energy of the particles because every particle has also got a different amount of energy. 
So now let's talk about the different phases in particular, and I've already mentioned most of this. The particles in the solid phase have got very little kinetic energy, and they vibrate at a fixed point. They have very strong forces of attraction, and that's why they can stick next to each other. And they've also got strong forces of repulsion. So that means they cannot be compressed. And you guys know this, if you had to take your, I don't know, um, your coffee mug, for example, and it's made from porcelain, okay, from clay, and it's been baked, and you try and push it, okay, unless you have a hulk, okay, chances are that as you push it from both sides, you're not going to see anything happening, okay, you can squeeze it nicely, there will be no compression. And the reason is because all the little particles have got both forces of attraction, which allow them to keep together, otherwise you wouldn't have a coffee mug at all, but they also have strong forces of repulsion if we push them too close to each other. So let me explain that to you. If you have an atom here, and here is the atom, and I know I'm going to move on to the atom and the, the the development of the atomic model, but let me, I know that you guys kind of know what the atom looks like at the moment already. So let me just explain. Okay, we've got a positive nucleus and we've got this bunch of electrons flowing around it. Okay, here's your electrons. Um, okay, let me, I'll change colors in a second. And then you've got another atom with a nucleus. Okay, and here's an electron. Okay, so let me just change colors quickly so you can see where the electrons are. Okay, so here's an electron, here's an electron. Okay, so if these atoms are at the right distance away, then what's going to happen is this electron is going to be attracted to the positive nucleus, and this electron will be attracted to the positive nucleus, and vice versa. So everything's attracted to each other nicely, and life is cool, and they will allow each other to be nice and close together. However, if you try and squeeze your stuff close together, then what happens is your atoms will start to overlap, okay? And then here will be the big positive nucleus and the big positive nucleus. And all that's going to happen is that this positive nucleus is going to see that positive nucleus and they're going to repel. They're going to push each other away and they're going to push each other away until they get to the point here where they're happy and they're just attracting each other again nice and comfortably, okay? So that is the reason why we cannot compress our solids because they've got very strong forces of repulsion. That's also the reason they have a fixed shape because they've got this happy medium where the forces of attraction and force of repulsion actually match each other and then they'll be kept in a fixed shape. Now let's talk about the liquids. You'll see here, if just let's go back for a second. Do you see that here, yeah, the solids were all next to each other and they were beautifully shaped and I could have drawn a line straight across, we and straight across, and then so on, okay? So do you see that they're in a nice, orderly, neat diagram and they are just vibrating on the spot? Whereas your liquids are also vibrating, but you'll see that they are kind of more randomly spaced out, okay? They're moving around a bit, okay? And this is because one most important thing is that they've got weaker forces of attraction. And because they've got weaker forces of attraction, they can actually move more freely past each other. So they're no longer stuck in that rigid shape. They can kind of slide around each other and move around each other. They can take the shape of a container. So if your container looks looks like, and I again apologize, I've never been an artist, and never will be, no matter how hard I try. Okay, so let's say the container looks like there's a horrible drawing, but the point is that if I fill this up with liquid, it's not just going to form a little rigid shape like that, it's going to fill the whole thing Okay, the whole thing, and it's even going to go a little bit up here, okay, depending on whether or not there's an infect it'll pour out because it's higher than that. Okay, but the point is that it takes the whole shape of the container because of the fact that they have got weaker forces of attraction. The particles have got different velocities, but the same average kinetic energy throughout the liquid, and that's because the liquid is all at the same 
temperature. So each particle will have different velocities because it will depend on how much energy it's gained or lost depending on what it's been bouncing against, okay? But the average kinetic energy throughout the liquid will remain the same. There are also strong repulsive forces, which means a little to no compression. And I'm just going to raise my writing so that you can actually see that. Uh, let's raise it. Okay, so there's little to no compression. And for those of you that are into cars and that, you will know that a lot of times the braking system and even the systems that we use um, to lock and open doors, nowadays um, it's more air, not the brakes, but the, the system to open and close, but you get what is called hydraulic pressure. And the hydraulic pressure is when they use liquid and the fact that the liquid cannot be compressed to open and close things, okay, or to be used as a braking system. So they've got very strong repulsive forces. Finally, the particles collide with each other and walls of the container and this produces something we haven't spoken before, which is pressure. Now pressure is basically a measure of the number of collisions and the force of them per unit time. Okay, pressure's official definition, pressure is equal to your force over your area. Okay, that's the official definition. It's newtons per square meter. But what it really is when it comes to liquid and gas is, sorry, that's not the time, that's area. What it really is, is how much these little particles, atoms are bumping against the side. And the more they bump against the side, the more pressure they are putting on the side because of the force with which they're bumping, okay? So you guys will have seen this as well because if you say, for example, leave a cool drink bottle, say a Coke bottle in the car and it's empty, or maybe it's got a little bit of Coke at the bottom, but you leave it in the car at night and it's night is nice and cool, right? And let's say the next day at lunchtime, you go and you go and pick go into the car and you see, oh, look, there's your Coke bottle. But what you'll notice is that when you left your Coke bottle, it was its normal shape, and I'm assuming this is a plastic Coke bottle, okay? When you see it the next day, it will be bulbous. It'll actually stick out like this. The sides will be like that, okay? And you might even find it quite difficult to open, and when it does, everything shoots out. And the reason for this is at this point, it was cold, Okay, so the particles had very little kinetic energy and the gas in the liquid was kept inside the liquid. It wasn't getting out, okay? Whereas, yeah, after a whole half a day in the hot sun in the car, and we all know the cars get very hot in the sun, what has happened is that the gas particles have been moving around lots and they've expanded and they've been bouncing against the sides. And there is much more pressure against the sides of the container. And if you had to manage to open this, if it didn't already pop open by itself, it would pop out and it would go whoosh, okay? And the liquid would actually also squirt out. And on top of that, if there was gas in this liquid, it would be very, very bubbly now because of this pressure. Okay, so particles colliding with each other and with the walls of the container produce a pressure. Right, so that's liquids. Now I saw gases. And note in my little picture here how the molecules have decreased in number. Okay, let's just go back for a second. Yeah, it was, oh, I don't have to do this. Okay, there's the solids, right? Yeah, it's the liquids. And uh, now we get to gases. And there's only three little particles inside the container in the same area. And why? Because gas particles have got huge amounts of energy and they move very far apart from each other, and they've got very weak forces of attraction or repulsion between them, okay? They are very for weak forces of attraction or repulsion between them, very weak, 
okay? Which means that they've got very little reason to stay close together. Okay, they've got way more average kinetic energy, which means they're going to zoom around lots and bounce off the sides of the container and off each other, etc., etc. They've got more motion and they're faster. Now, the random motion of the elastic collisions causes pressure. Now, if you remember over here, I was talking about the particles colliding with each other in the walls of container and I mentioned the gas in this, but I also mentioned the liquid. Now, I was using this analogy, which is mainly gas, to describe how particles colliding with each other in the walls can cause pressure. Okay, exactly the same thing would happen whether or not this was a closed container of your Coke, as in there was no gas, or it was an empty container of your Coke. Now, this happens even more with gases. If you just have gases, then you have the random motion with the elastic collisions causes even more pressure than the liquid. There are no repulsive forces. Okay, I, I'm hesitant to say that. Officially, the kinetic molecular theory says there are no repulsive forces. Fair enough, but when they come together, they do feel forces of repulsion. They're much weaker than for the liquids and the solids, but they are there. So the particles are so far apart, that's what they're saying, that no repulsive forces are effectively acting on the particles. But when the particles do come close together, then obviously there is some form of repulsion, but it is much weaker than for the liquids and the gases. So because of this, it's very easy to compress gas and particles move at different speeds, but the average kinetic energy of the gas is again the same throughout. Right. Okay, so now that we've spoken about kinetic molecular theory, we are going to move on to the atom. Before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit about more about the kinetic molecular theory. Guys, the type of questions you're going to be asked will be to explain why gases are compressible and liquids are a little bit compressible and solids are not. Or they might say to you, um, explain why the solids are rigid and gases take up the whole space. Or they might say to you, last example, um, your teacher walks into the room and you can immediately smell her perfume, well not immediately, but after a few minutes, you can smell her perfume even though you're sitting in the back of the classroom. And then the question will be, use kinetic molecular theory to explain how you can smell your teacher's perfume. And what you'd have to say is that the perfume is obviously in the gaseous phase, the and what is happening is that there are random, because the gas particles have got huge amounts of energy, they can move far and they can move fast. And they are obviously have going to have collisions between each other, which means that they'll move even further. And eventually you will smell the little particles. Okay, so you need to use the kinetic molecular theory to explain that. Right, let's talk about the atom. Now, the only part of history, it used to have a lot of history in the grade 10 science curriculum, but now we have um, sorry, I got distracted, but now we have only one section that has actually got the history, okay? And this is basically um, the history of the atom, which you do actually need to know, and it is examinable in grade 10. So let's go through it. First of all, there's this dude, Democritus, and there's this hazy picture on the right hand side. And the reason it's the hazy picture is because of the fact that it um, is a picture of a statue. Okay, not a very good statue because he was around in 400 BC. 400 BC. Let's think about this. Okay, we're at 2016. That was at zero. Then you've that's at zero AD. From, and then he was at 400 BC. So he was around approximately 2,400 years ago. So yes, we do have a very rough image of what he looks like. But he was a Greek philosopher and he was a very intelligent man. And what he does was he asked could matter be divided into smaller pieces forever? So he was the very first person 
to consider the fact that there might be smaller pieces that people, that matter could be divided into smaller pieces. Okay, so his theory said, matter could not be divided into smaller and smaller pieces forever. Eventually we would get to a smallest possible piece, okay? But this piece would be indivisible indivisible okay and he named the smallest piece a thomas which means indivisible or cannot be cut so for him atoms were small hard particles of different types for example cheese had basic cheese particles and wood had basic wood particles and i don't know ink would have diff basic ink particles etc so he thought that everything was made up of different types of particles and they were all little hard particles okay so that was Democritus' theory. Now, if you look at the development of the atomic theory, you've got the Greek model in dear old 400 BC, which is Democritus, okay? Then, then there's this huge gap and there is old Dalton in 1803, okay? So that's approximately, what is that? That's 1,000, that's 2,000 years. Okay, it's a lot of years. Okay, so 1,800 plus 400. So it's a lot of years which you have to wait for somebody to come and look at that model again. And there was a reason for the delay, and we'll talk about that then. It's not in the next slide. It's because of Aristotle and Plato. And then after them, you'll see these nice little increases. There's the Thomson model, Rutherford model, Bohr model, and then the wave model, which we don't talk about. We go as far as the Bohr model. Okay. So let's talk about Aristotle. So Aristotle and Plato came up with the four elements of air, fire, earth, and water. And if you guys have ever played any computer games, I'm sure you've heard of air benders and fire benders and earth benders and that type of thing. They all are just playing on the fact that Aristotle and Plato said that there weren't these millions of little elements that made up your atoms, like a Thomas and that. What there was, was actually just four elements that made up everything by combination. So they thought that there was air, fire, earth, and water, and a combination of, for example, air and water would give us something, and earth and fire would give us something. Okay, so they ruled the roost for many, many, many years, and it was only in 1803 when an English chemist restudied Democritus' work, okay? So he, it was quite a long time later when he came along and what he did was he performed a number of experiments that led to the idea that actually maybe Democritus was right and they were possibly atoms, okay? He deduced a whole bunch of things and a lot of the things that he deduced were actually based on Democritus' work. So there wasn't anything new, okay? But he published. He wrote about it and because he was British and I'm not being rude about the British, it's just that they were the reigning, one of the reigning empires at the time. So he could spread the word, okay? When Democritus was um, talking about it be the de, talking about the atom, okay, or his Thomas, the Greeks were kind of the the intellectual um, people to be speaking to and listening to. Now at this point era of 1803, the British were up there, okay? They weren't the only people, but they were up there. So, Dalton deduced that all elements were composed of atoms. Tick, same as Democritus, okay? Atoms were indivisible and indestructible, same as dear old Greek Democritus. Atoms are the same element exactly alike, exactly the same as Democritus, okay? Remember Democritus said they would have cheese atoms and wood atoms and paper atoms and coffee atoms okay he also said that atoms of different elements are different exactly the same and then he built on a bit he said that compounds are formed by joining the atoms of two or more elements so that was new that was his own work so what he did was he drew up his own little table of basically what he thought the atoms would look like so well, not really what they would look like, but he drew up his own symbols, okay? So, for example, he represented hydrogen with a circle and a dot in the middle. Nitrogen was a circle with a line, and carbon, for example, was a closed dot. So then, when he had what we call now, let's take water, we know that water is made up of 
H2O. So we know that it's made up of one oxygen atom and two little hydrogen atoms, right? He knew, which is quite impressive actually, he knew that water had oxygen and hydrogen in it, okay? So therefore his water symbol was one oxygen and one hydrogen. He didn't know the ratio, but he knew that that's what they consisted of. Ammonia, we know today is NH3, okay? He knew in his time that it was made up of nitrogen and hydrogen. Again, he didn't know the ratios. He didn't know there were three hydrogens to nitrogen. He just knew that he could break up ammonia and get at nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. So this was his formula for ammonia. Okay, so that was Dalton's theory. Let's move on. J.J. Thompson in 1897 was also an English scientist and he was the first to suggest that the atom is actually made of even smaller particles, okay? So what he suggested is called today the plum pudding model. That's what it was called then. Nowadays, it's also referred to as the chocolate chip pudding, okay? The chocolate chip cookie, okay? I don't want you to think of it as just a chocolate cookie chip cookie because it's three-dimensional so you've got to think of a sphere so it's a round chocolate chip cookie okay so Thompson proposed that what you had was a solid ball which was all positive okay so there's one big positively charged solid ball and then embedded in it like these chocolate chips or what could possibly look like raisins but chocolate chips okay embedded in it would be the negatively charged electrons, okay? So they're stuck into this big positively charged ball, okay? So that's what he thought the atom looked like, okay? But he was the very first person to say, well, actually, he thinks that there's smaller bits to this atom. So that was actually quite a huge leap in the model of the atom. So Thompson studied the passage of the electric current through a gas using a cathode ray tube. And he noticed something very interesting. And I've got a little video here for you guys. So let me see if I can play it. A cathode ray tube is the forerunner of the television tube. It is a glass tube from which most of the air has been evacuated. When the two metal plates are connected to a high voltage source, the negatively charged plate, called the cathode, emits an invisible ray. The cathode ray is drawn to the positively charged plate, called the anode, where it passes through a hole and continues traveling to the other end of the tube. When the ray strikes the specially coated surface, the cathode ray produces a strong fluorescence or bright light. Right. When an electric field is applied across the cathode ray tube, the cathode ray is attracted by the plate bearing positive charges. Therefore, the cathode ray must consist of negatively charged particles. Right, so what did he notice? He noticed, okay, so what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna play it again, but we're gonna silent it, okay, right. So what he said was that we had a cathode ray tube, which he was basically sending through charges, okay, but he's put an electric field across the charges, right? And what they noticed was that, what they expected was it to just shine at one point, right? One point, but, if they then go and put this field across it, okay, then what happens is, this electric field across it, is that the, the, the change it changes where it shines on. And what that means, if you look here, this is positively charged and this is negatively charged. Let me just change it, sorry. This is positively charged, let me pause. Okay, and go back just a tad. This end here is positively charged and this here end here is negatively charged. So do you see that these are being attracted to the positively charged plate, which means they have to be negative. Okay, so Thompson realized that there was obviously negative charges in this, in this current, okay? I mean, in this, in this stream of charges. So, what he concluded was that there were negative charges that came from within the atom. Okay, let's go back and get my pen again. 
okay? There were negative charges that were coming from within the atom. So therefore, the smaller particle than an atom had to exist, okay? So before, we had this model, right? Where you had the po big positive charge and then you had these little negative charges, but they were embedded into this positive charge. Now Thompson is saying, but hang on, that can't be true because we've got a deviation where if we bring an electric field or magnetic field through here, these charges get attracted down, okay? So therefore, the atom was divisible. So Thompson called these negatively charged corpuscles, okay? So he called them corpuscles, but today we call them electrons. Today we call them electrons. And it says, since the gas was known to be neutral, having no charge, he reasoned that there must be positively charged particles in the atom as well. Okay, so he said, right, we know this gas is neutral in charge. We know that there are negatively charged electrons or corpuscles that are being attracted. So that means that if everything is neutral, there must be positively charged particles in the atom as well, but he could never find them, okay, but he knew they had to be there. Right, now, Ernest Rutherford, he was discovered this in 1908, he is an English physicist and he did the gold foil experiment. Now, the coolest thing about the gold foil experiment is this, he did it to demonstrate to his students, he was working at a university and was working as a lecturer, and he actually believed that atoms were little solid balls. That's what he believed. So he set up this experiment to show students that with this experiment, you could see evidence of these little solid balls, okay? However, the experiment disproved his theory. Okay, so let's watch this little video again. of an atom was first discovered when a beam of positively charged particles emitted from a radioactive source was aimed at a fluorescent screen. The particles caused the fluorescent screen to glow. When a very thin sheet of gold foil was placed in the pathway of the particle beam, a few particles were deflected to the side. Occasionally, particles were deflected straight back. But nearly all particles passed right through the gold foil, as if it were not there. The scientists concluded that atoms must be mostly empty space, and that because some particles are deflected, there must be a small positively charged central mass, which they called the nucleus. Right, so let's talk about this. What was going to happen was that he was expecting, what was he expecting? He was had this alpha particle emitter, emitter, alpha particle emitter. Now that's a radioactive source. And the alpha particle is actually very large in size. And what he was expecting was that when this shone through these alpha particles, a hole would form in the gold foil and there'd be a bright spot here. That's what he was expecting. And as you saw in the video, what actually happened is that it was you, there was a bright spot, but there was no hole in this foil at all. And this foil is ridiculously thin. It's like one, one atom thickness thin, okay? It is thin, okay? He, in his memoirs, wrote that it was the equivalent of shooting a cannonball through tissue paper. So if you take a huge sheet of tissue paper and you shot a cannonball through it, obviously you'd expect the, the tissue paper to be ripped to shreds. And that's what he expected. He expected there to be this huge hole in the gold foil, but there was no hole, okay? So what they realized that most of the positively charged bullets pass right through the gold atoms in the sheet without change in course, okay? Some of the positively charged, he called them bullets, they didn't call them alpha particles at the time, did bounce away from the gold sheet as if it hit something solid. So he knew that obviously positive charges repelled positive charges, okay? So even though they knew, they, they called these bullets, they knew that these were positively charged, right? So he concluded the following thing. He said this could only mean that the gold atoms in the sheet were mostly open space. Atoms were not a pudding full of positively charged material. He also concluded that the atom had a small, dense, positively charged center that repelled his positively charged bullets. And he called the center of the atom the nucleus. 
and the nucleus is tiny compared to the whole. So if you had to draw a picture explaining it, and guys, you really need to learn this because often, very often, you get asked to explain Rutherford's conclusions with a diagram in your tests and exams when it comes to your grade 10 science. So this is what we've got. We've got a beam of alpha particles. Some of them go straight through. Whee! Okay. Some of them get repelled. Okay. And some of them get deflected. And the reason they can go straight through is because the nucleus is tiny compared to the atom as a whole. So the most of the space of an atom is free. There's nothing there. Okay. Secondly, that if it gets deflected, or reflected entirely, it is because it has come into contact with a center of the atom, which is nucleus. Okay, which is the nucleus. So that was Rutherford's conclusions. And that's all we have time for, for today. Please make sure you understand this, come back, watch it again, and learn this stuff, grade 10s. Please, it's important. It forms a big part of your curriculum this year. Have a great day.